Hi there, this is Manuel with Intagma. Today looking at more procedural techniques inside of Blender. One procedural area of Blender is a shader editor. You can build procedural shaders for Cycles and Eevee. And today I want to build a procedural hatching shader for Cycles that comes in handy whenever you want to do some NPR rendering. So let's dive in and get started. For this project I downloaded this bust from a site full of free 3D scans, you can find the link in the description, and I brought it into Blender to apply my shader to it. To create some 3D procedural hatching we first will need some lines. So let's first apply a shader to this bust and call it hatching. And then let's go in and delete the principal BSDF as we won't need it, for now at least. Now how can we create some procedural lines? Let's first create a texture coordinates node. If I connect this up, you see this is a generated coordinates. The model does not have any UV coordinates, but we won't need them anyways, because we want to create the lines in camera space. So we want to use this camera output. This camera output gives us the position of the camera. So we will need a camera. Let's create a camera quickly. Camera, and let's use it here in this viewport. Let's make this a little smaller, like so, and maybe let's go in and make this square, like so. Okay, and you can see these coordinates are zero here in the middle of the camera, because it is using the camera coordinate space. First we want to decide in which direction we want to create the lines, and I want to create them in the local y direction. So put down a separate XYZ converter, separate XYZ and connect it here. Let's use the Y coordinates, but because the zero point of the camera is in the middle of the frame, that won't work. So we want to move the entire coordinate space down. To do that, we want to use a math node and connect it after the separate, set it to add and add a value of 10 to this. That moves all the coordinates down. So now we are entirely in the positive coordinate space. And now we want to use a modulo function to turn this smooth value range into a step one. We want to turn a function that looks like this into a function that looks like this. So like a sawtooth pattern. And this can be done using a modulo. Let me get rid of this annotation quickly. So let's duplicate this node and put it here and switch it over to modulo. And you can see that we get this fold here, because the modulo function just gives us the remainder of the division of the incoming value by this second value that is currently set to 10. That means that we have a smooth function that raises up to 10 and then falls down to zero again. But we do not want to use 10, instead we want to use one. And now you get this alternating pattern, but it is still very large. So let's use a multiply function before the modulo, multiply, to just multiply the value range up a little. And that gives quite some lines, maybe only 20 for now, such that we can see something here, like so. So now we have lines. If I quickly switch back to one, you can see that these values here start at zero and then go up to one and then fall down to zero again. That is nice, but it is a sawtooth pattern and what we want is spikes. So we want lines that are one in the middle and then fall down to black and then alternating up to one. That can be done by first transforming this value range into the negatives and then folding the entire function over using an absolute value. So let's first convert this to a value range of minus one to one by multiplying everything with two and then subtracting one. Subtract one. So now you can see by this blackness here, by this darkness, that the values are negative in parts. And now if we use an absolute value, absolute, it folds over the negative part. So what happens is that we have this sawtooth pattern, like so, and then we convert it into the negative, meaning that it goes like this. And then we use this absolute, which will fold everything over that is in the negatives. So it will look like this, but then this part here will be positive again. So it will go down like this, and then up like this, and then down like this. So we end up with this pattern that is only positive. Okay, time to increase the multiplier again from one to say 20. And here we have our lines on our object in camera space. As you can see, if I navigate the camera, these lines won't move because they are created in camera space. 
Fantastic, so we can use these lines for our hatching shader, but now think about what we need as a second ingredient, and that is the actual shading of this bust. So if we quickly create ourselves a principled BSDF and connect it to the output, you will see that we have some shading here. At the moment, it only comes from this HDR in the background, so let's create a light source, light, point light. Let's quickly switch over to 3D viewport to be able to position this light a little easier. Let's put it over there and then go to the light source and give it some more power. Now you can see what's happening here. What we want to do is to take the effect of the shader, so this shading of the bust, and then use this shading as color information to combine it with the lines to create a hatched area where these shading values are gray. So where it goes from black to white, we want to have lines, and these lines should increase and decrease in thickness. So the big problem is how can we read this shading as color information inside of the shader? And unfortunately we cannot. So what we have to do is we have to build it ourselves. The 3D shading you see here is called dot product lighting, at least it is similar. And how it works is the following. Imagine you have a polygon in 3D and I draw it here in 2D only and then you have a normal vector like so. Then in the scene there is a light source. If the renderer wants to determine the shading of the polygon, it creates a vector pointing from the midpoint of this polygon to the light. And then it compares both vectors and finds the angle between them. It's easy to see if the angle is zero or very low, then the polygon gets all the light. But if the angle is bigger than 90 degrees, this polygon will not get any light. To recreate the shading entirely inside of the shader, we'll want to find the vector to the light and then calculate the dot product between the normal and this light vector. So let's get started. The normal we already have here. Now we need the light. So let's duplicate the texture coordinates and by specifying which object to use in this field down here, in our case the 0 .001 light source, we get information about the shading point in the space of the light. So if we look at the object output, that is the position of the shading point in the space of the light. To clearly see that, we can quickly take this light and move it over here, and you see there is the zero point. So these colors resemble the vector from the shading point to the light. That is pretty much what we need. It's just that these values are inverted. We have to first invert these values. To do that, let's create a vector math node, vector math, and let's set it to multiply and multiply everything by minus one to invert the vectors, like so. And then we want to normalize them because the dot product only gives reliable results if both vectors are normalized. To normalize these, duplicate the vector math and set this to normalize and normalize these vectors. Now we have the normals at the shading point and we have the vectors to the light source, exactly what we need. So we now can just use another vector mass to calculate the dot product. And here we have it. That was a wrong connection. We want to compare the normal and these vectors and see what that gives. Remember that Node Wrangler is giving me an emission shader for previewing. Nevertheless, I get 3D shading in the viewport because I calculated myself. One last thing is that these values may exceed the value range 0 to 1, and that is not a good thing. So let's create another math node, convert a math. Let's switch this to maximum, and let's use the maximum of this and 0. This way we won't get any negative values. So now we have 3D shading as color information inside of our shader and we have lines. Time to combine both. First we want to take care about this transition area. And you can interpret these colors on the surface of the model as a function. So again, you have increasing and decreasing values. And to control the slope of this function, we can just multiply the result. So let's duplicate one of these math nodes and switch it over to multiply and connect this here. If we multiply this up, you see that the result gets harder because the slope of the function gets steeper. Now we want to transpose this function, or at least we want to be able to transpose the function. So we duplicate this node again and put it here and set it to add. And now we can move the entire function up and down. So we can decide where the 0 0.5 
point is. So what this is, is just the line equation. Basically, if you have a function, y is mx plus t, that means this is the slope, this m here, and the t transposes the function up and down. Think of it as having a line, and if you increase m, this will be steeper, and with t, you can move it down, and you can set the inception point. That is what I do here. Now, with this out of the way, let's introduce the lines to this shading by subtracting them. Duplicate this node, set it to subtract, and subtract the lines from this, and you see immediately you get some lines. Because now you take the shading as a function and you subtract either 0 or 1 or the values in between from it, and that gives these alternating lines. Let's go down again to 1 here and to 0 here, and you see now you have these lines. And you can control the hardness of the basic shading here, transpose it here, and then subtract the lines. Okay, that is great. See, I can just make this harder or less hard. But it would be great if I could control the hardness of the final result, so nothing easier than that. Just duplicate this math node and multiply everything by another math node, and that is now the hardness of the result. So now you have full control over this shader. First you can say how hard the initial shading function is, and here you can say how hard the result should be. The gradation basically can be controlled. Fantastic! And that is basically our line shader. It's just that the lines are all horizontal and that is not necessarily pretty. Why don't we just rotate the vectors that are used to create the lines in the first place? We can go up here before the separate x, y, z and introduce a vector rotate. Vector rotate. And let's put it here between the camera vector and this vector. And this node now can be used to rotate these vectors just by using this angle down here. And you can see that I now can angle my lines, of course, because I'm rotating the input vectors. So to make this a little more pretty, let's go to 1.4 here and to 1.5 here. And that gives some decent lines. Maybe we want even more lines, say 30. And here you have your hatching. The last part is to make this look a little nicer. For this we will need this principle BSDF, because I'm building this in cycle for a reason, because I want this NPR hatching combined with realistic shading of the surfaces. But before we set up the shader, let's quickly go to the 3D viewport and create a background. So let's introduce a cube here and quickly delete these two points. There it is. Now let's bevel this edge like so, give this a some subdivisions, and set everything to shade smooth, and then we want to move it up, like so, item, let's move it up to 0, zero 1, and then I can say object set origin, origin to 3D cursor, of course the object should be selected, origin to 3D cursor like so, and now I can just scale this up to give myself a background like so. Still the bust is flying a little higher. Now I have this background. What about the light? Let's see. Position it over there to get some nice shading. Well, back to the shader, and now Let's use these black and white lines as an input to this principle BSDF, but before we do that, let's create a color ramp, color ramp, and let's pipe this result through this color ramp, get rid of this end panel through the color ramp, and then to the principle BSDF and make it visible. And you see the principle BSDF now creates shading and takes the line as an input so we get all the shadows. And now we can just set the colors to something a little bit more pretty. I want to use a red here, an orangey red, and on this side some sort of yellow, like so. And now to give it more of an NPR look, I want to color the shadows. How can that be done? Well, for the shader rays, I just want to use a different shader. So duplicate this principal BSDF and set it to something ridiculous right now, like green. And now I want to combine these two shaders by using a mix shader node. So combine both of them. 
and you see that it's just a mixture. Now with this factor you can mix between the green one and the one with the lines. But we do not want to control this factor manually, instead we want to use a light path node for this. So look for a light path node, and this light path node tells us the type of ray that the renderer is currently shooting, and we want to connect the camera ray to this. Is camera ray. And of course we have to switch the shaders like so. And now you see, if it is a camera ray, we get our hatching shader, but if it's an indirect ray, the green shader is used, and that gives green shadows. And I found this to be quite nice. Last but not least, the background needs a shader too, like so. And let's just create one of these orangey colors for the background too, like so. And now it's probably time to increase the power of the light by a good amount again. And that concludes the hatching shader. Now you have a hatching shader that is combined with Cycle's realistic rendering goodness that reacts to the light, because we build the shading inside of the shader and use the same light that Cycle uses for rendering. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and happy rendering! If you like what we are doing, please consider becoming a Patreon. For supporting us and for access to more in-depth courses on topics like volume techniques or PDG or Vellum and more. To everybody who is already supporting us, thank you so much. Without your continuous support, Entangma would not be possible.